Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursdays speaker series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Thank you everyone for joining. I'm Michaela Hall, Assistant Director of the Library. I want to thank you all for attending the program and also thank those that put a lot of hard work uh, to make this program happen tonight. Belinda Decay, Library Director, the Library's Program Committee, and of course Lee Howard and Tom Shook. All participants, as I had been saying before, please keep your video off and your mics muted unless asked by myself, Lee or Tom to turn them on. This will ensure there's no sound interference or lag during the presentation. If you have any questions uh, throughout the meeting, please put them in the chat. Um, and library staff member Ivy Burns will be monitoring that. All questions will be answered by Lee and Tom when we are ready to open up Q&A. If you look in the chat, I posted a couple of links in the chat. The first one is to a list of primary resources that are relevant to tonight's talk, um, which Tom put together. It includes some links to period newspapers that viewers may find interesting for background information and context. Tom stated that he finds reading these articles written in real time quite fascinating and very different from reading them in history textbooks where the writer already knows the ultimate outcome. And I will also email the resource list link to all registrants after the event tonight. I am also recording the program, but we will make sure that all personal information is edited out, such as your names, um, before it's uploaded to our YouTube channel. So thank you again, everyone, for joining. And I'm now turning it over to Belinda Decay, the Library Director. So, um, thank you, Michaela, for being our host and making everything run so smoothly. It's, it's really wonderful. And welcome to everyone who has joined us this afternoon for another of our Stonington Free Library's Thoughtful Thursday programs. This one is Anatomy of a New Story, Frederick Douglass in New London. And I just want to say sometimes good ideas take on a life of their own, and this is one of those moments. On the July 4th weekend, I read the article about Frederick Douglass in the New London Day. And at the time, it was a very strange 4th of July. And like everyone, I was feeling um, very uh, anguished about all the challenges facing us um, with the pandemic and also the murder of George Floyd. And when I saw this article, I was so excited because I felt that it wasn't just about past history, it was our present history, and it was speaking to this moment for us. And I was so um, encouraged at that moment, having been so discouraged, that I immediately sent off an email to Lee to thank him, just thank him for it. And he got right back with a proposal for a program for the library. And so here we are. And it is with the greatest pleasure that I welcome our distinguished speakers, Lee Howard and Tom Shook. So Lee. Runs the eight weekly newspapers operated by the Day Publishing Company. He's a graduate of Washington and Lee University. Over his 40-year career in journalism, he's received many awards, in particular the prestigious Theodore Driscoll Award for Investigative Reporting from the Connecticut Society of Professional Journalists. And in 2008, he received a fellowship from the National Press Foundation in Washington, DC. And this is just two that I selected from a very long list. He served in every department of the day over the years. Uh, he's an avid tennis player, a youth basketball coach, and volunteers for the Special Olympics. 
which I think makes him a rena Renaissance man, right? <laughs> I also have to add that he's a passionate supporter of libraries and has a wonderful understanding of their value in the life of any community and their role in sustaining democracy. Uh, which is my segue into saying that the same applies to our local newspapers and how vital they are and how we need to support them for their sake and for ours. And Tom Shook, who is a creative force behind our story today, is a New London native, a graduate of Georgetown University and recently retired from being executive director of a local residential facility for troubled ad adolescent males. He's a passionate history buff with an interest in the Civil War and John Brown, but most particularly, and this is very interesting, he is a Sherlock Holmes fan, which has led him to focus on unknown, hidden, forgotten, or suppressed local history. Thus, the story of Frederick Douglass. And before that, his account of the city's connection, that's New London's connection, to the Green Book used by African Americans to navigate Jim Crow America. So that's really exciting, and we're so looking forward to hearing from you. So on behalf of us all, I welcome Lee and Tom. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Belinda and Michaela, for setting us up today. Uh, it was a short uh, jump from uh, a story to actually putting this together. So amazing work to, to get that done. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask Tom to start the program. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background and how you became interested in history, particularly African American history. Okay, well, the, the short version for purposes of this uh, Zoom, uh, when I went away to college, I was going to be a history and government major. Uh, and of course, I went to school in Washington, D.C., which is uh, living history. And uh, I was there at a period of time when a lot of that living history happened. I was there in 67 to 74. And you can just reel off the things that happened uh, during that time. It was amazing to be there. Uh, as it turned out, I, I did not remain a history major. I became a psychology major. But I was always interested in history. Uh, I did a lot of reading, uh, particularly about John Brown and uh, Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. I uh, about 10 years ago, I joined a, a Civil War roundtable, uh, a local one here, and that, again, fueled my interest. Uh, I became interested in New London history uh, after joining a Facebook group that focused on history, and I discovered a few things that were uh, kind of obscure, and I realized that, geez, a lot of the history that we know about New London, it, it only tells half of the story. So I became uh, interested in, in kind of delving uh, into that discovered the story of Ichabod Pease. And uh, I thought, geez, I wonder, oh, what, what actually initiated was uh, I discovered that cars were manufactured in New London. And I'm a car guy, and I never heard of cars manufactured in New London. And I went to New London County Historical Society. They had never heard of it, and they were three quarters of a mile from the factory. So I thought, I wonder what else about New London is hidden or undiscovered. And that's what got me started. And yes, the Sherlock Holmes bit plays into that. All right. Great. Uh, well, tell me about what got you started looking into Frederick Douglass and its connection or his connection to New London. Well, uh, you know, I, I don't recall exactly what I was doing that night. I do a lot of uh, research on the on the Internet. And if you can ask my wife, uh, I, I, probably too much time. Uh, and sometimes I just throw out a wide net. But I was looking into uh, some New London history and I came up with a, a link to uh, New London being mentioned in the North Star. And I knew the North Star was Frederick Douglass's newspaper. I thought, boy, I wonder what this is all about. So I looked at it and sure enough, it was not only mentioned New London, but it mentioned that he spoke in New London. And I thought, oh, I've never heard of this. What, what, what's going on here? And I went through it. And sure enough, he gave four lectures here. Uh, and uh, it, I, it was just uh, amazing to me uh, that uh, I don't recall anyone ever talking about that before. And I, I, I was unbelievably excited to, to find that. I thought, geez, you know. But, and so I, I just tried to pin it down as much as I could. Yeah. Okay. And uh, tell me about where you went for some of your uh, sources of information and uh, what were some of the most valuable pieces you found along the way? 
Uh, let's see. Well, the North Star being one, I guess. Right. Well, first of all, uh, the research that I rely on, or the, the researcher that I rely on a lot of, most of the time, is my friend, Dr. Google. Uh, who seems to have access to a tremendous amount of information all the time. So I use him a lot, uh, and, and I use uh, a couple of sites uh, in particular. There's one called the Hathi Trust, H-A-T-H-I, and they have uh, complete books online that you can access and you can read page by page. Uh, the New York Public Library, speaking of the importance of libraries, uh, has a digital collection of uh, a tremendous amount of stuff, but uh, particularly an African-American section uh, that is, uh, for example, uh, the Green Book, uh, the original copies of the Green Book are nearly impossible to find, uh, but they have uh, digitized uh, about 25 uh, editions. You can read them page by page, and that was how I found out all the information that uh, there were Green Book sites in New London. There were 10 of them. Uh, there's another site called JSTOR, S-T-O-R, J-S-T-O-R. I'm not even sure what that stands for, but that another tremendous resource with uh, 12 million uh, journal articles and 85,000 books and 2 million primary documents. It's all unbelievable treasure trove in there. Uh, locally, I use the, uh, I'm, I'm a denizen of the uh, New London City Hall property records research vault, or property records vault, where they have all the property records dating back to 1646. Uh, and it's an amazing amount of information contained in those records, including, for example, uh, uh, slave, enslaved people were considered property. So there are many transactions that you will find in there uh, regarding uh, people uh, buying, selling, trading uh, enslaved people. Uh, I, this was stunning to me. Uh, and it's a tremendous resource. I've also used the New London Public Library. They have city directories going back to 1853. Uh, a lot of people use genealogy sites. I don't use those very much, uh, but I do use the US Census records. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Book Barn in Niantic, which is a wonderful resource for, for it's unbelievable. What you, you never know what you're gonna find there. That's true, treasure trove. So, yeah. uh, so I, I know that uh, Douglas uh, spoke not only in New London, but later on in Mystic as well. So how did you feel uh, once you pieced together this New London connection and, uh, and the fact that he seemed to be pretty well received in the city and, and that the speeches just came three or four weeks before they actually finally outlawed slavery in Connecticut. The, the whole story was amazing. I mean, I was surprised to find it. I was excited. Uh, I was shocked that it had never been, as far as I know, had never been talked about before. I mean, this is a, a, a hugely significant event. And, uh, and I was frankly ecstatic to, to find it. Uh, the, uh, as far as the, uh, uh, the, the reception that he got, uh, and, and the way he described New London fit in with a lot of the reading that I had been doing before. Uh, we, have, uh, we have kind of a preconceived notion of what New London was like, what Connecticut was like back in those days. We like to think of Connecticut as progressive, uh, you know, it's kind of a blue state. And, uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, it, 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 that's not completely accurate. Uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of history about New London that we don't know about. For example, in 1774, uh, New London County had the highest number of slaves of any county in New England. Uh, and, uh, and two of those towns, the significant towns, were New London first and Stonington second. And who would have thought? Uh, I, I didn't know that. Uh, in, 1830, in the 1830s, uh, New London was strongly anti-abolition. Uh, the, the, it was a pro-slavery town. Uh, again, uh, I didn't know that. Uh, and I don't know how many people know, oh, for example, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, the famous abolitionist, referred to uh, Connecticut as the Georgia of New England, uh, not in a flattering way. Uh, and uh, the other things, like uh, in, in New London had a race riot in 1919, uh, stuff like this. I mean, who knew about that? I don't remember being told about that. Anyway, the coincidence that it happened uh, that he that he spoke uh, in around May 20th, 1848, uh, uh, I knew that uh, 
Connecticut had abolished slavery in 1848, but I didn't know when. I thought, boy, isn't that a coincidence that he was here and then and they abolished slavery? I wonder which happened first. So I tracked it down, again, going through some of these sites, and I found it, sure enough, uh, Connecticut abolished slavery on June 12th, 1848. That was three weeks after he came here. Is there a connection? I don't know. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's certainly an extraordinary coincidence that it happened three weeks later. The most outspoken, uh, you know, person in America, uh, speaking on on the emancipation and abolition of slavery, uh, and three weeks later, I, it, you know, who knows? We don't know who was in the audience. We don't know right. actually what he even said. Uh, were there legislators in that audience? Uh, he gave right. four. Lectures. We don't know, but uh, it's 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 extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, you would certainly expect some of the leading lights of the era to have shown up for, you know, someone like him who was already pretty well known. But uh, so we don't, uh, have, we don't have a guest list. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, so tell me, um, how long, uh, how long after your discovery did you actually post it on social media? And what was the immediate reaction? Well, I posted it uh, as soon as I came down off the ceiling. <laughs> okay. I was so excited about this and I, I needed to just, you know, make sure that I could believe what I was reading. Uh, and so when I confirmed it, so I, I posted it probably within a couple of hours. That's one of the great things about, you know, our social media, you know, you don't have to wait for it to come out in Newsweek, uh, mm -hmm. a week, you can do it in 15 minutes. Uh, the uh, and then the initial reaction to that was was much like my own reaction. People were surprised and they were saying, "Geez, I never heard this." You know, are you sure of this? Uh, wow, this is this is amazing. Uh, he is probably the most influential uh, black American of the 19th century, uh, mm -hmm. and he was in London, and and we don't talk about it. Uh, the uh, this, this, by the way, putting it in context, this happened around uh, May 3rd, and that was before the George Floyd uh, murder, okay? Right. And uh, after that, uh, when that incident happened, uh, things changed a little bit on the, in terms of the reception. Uh, mm. But we, we can get into that maybe later if you want, but uh, it did yeah. change. Yeah, yeah. No, social media has its pros and then it has its cons, <laughs> yeah. as we all know. Uh, so uh, talk to talk about how you came to talk to me about doing an, uh, a news story on your discovery and what was your motivation and how did you approach me? Uh, let's see. Well, I knew that uh, that you were interested uh, we, because of our previous contact. I knew that you had an interest in in uh, in New London history. I know that your readership has uh, 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 an interest in it, and. Uh, I think it was uh, it was it was several weeks later. It was probably June, because uh, all of those events that were occurring nationally and the pandemic kind of interrupted things. And I had ne I hadn't pinned down exactly where it was, wh where the lecture took place. So I realized that, and I thought, geez, I'm, I'm going to try to pin that down. So I did more research, uh, and with uh, a variety of things, and did you, we figured out that uh, he spoke at Darts Hall. I thought, well, okay, well, where's Darts Hall? And I'm a maps guy. So uh, I started looking into all the old maps and trying to find the directories. And sure enough, it turns out it was on uh, a street called, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, I forget. It's, it's, it's now Atlantic Avenue. Right, uh, Atlantic Avenue now. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was Bradley Street. It was Bradley Street. Uh, so uh, I started comparing the new maps and the old maps. And uh, lo and behold, it turned out that... Uh, it looks like it is located exactly where the New London Day, uh, I think it's your, your mail room or your delivery room or something on, on the side. I thought, wow, I got to tell Lee, Har Lee Howard about this because <laughs> uh, I know that, that you would be uh, uh, you know, interested. Uh, and, and not only that, it, this is in the middle of a, by this time that there's a national conversation going on about uh, the you know, racial uh, inequities and social justice. And here's an opportunity for uh, the New London Day to be involved in something that relates to that. And it was actually took place on their property. So okay. that's when that's when I contacted you. And I was hoping that that you would be receptive and that the day would be receptive and that perhaps uh, we could uh, do something to commemorate that that site with a plaque or a marker. Uh, there is some of that going on in New London right now in regard to Ichabod Pease, where they're talking about uh, recognizing uh, some historic sites that have not been recognized. So I thought this is a great opportunity for, for the day to be involved. 
So. All right. And I think you contacted me on Facebook Messenger and then back, backed up your contention with some, uh, some historical tidbits that kind of whetted my appetite. So <laughs> that's kind of how it all happened. But uh, tell me about our actual interview. Uh, did it just focus on Frederick Douglass or did it go in other directions? <laughs> that's a loaded question. Because <laughs> that, that, that never happens. Uh, we, uh, I, I don't recall all of the details, but I, I do recall that uh, it, it happened on a Thursday and uh, it went on for, uh, I think, over an hour, maybe well, two hours. It was uh, close to two hours, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and so that was not limited to Frederick Douglass. Uh, it fed into, uh, th th this issue feeds into a lot of other things about New London and New London history that are not very well known. And uh, this, this, I saw this as kind of a, a jumping off point to introduce a lot of the other stuff uh, that, that has not been talked about. And it's not all pretty uh, right. about New London history. So I'm sure we talked about uh, a wide range of stuff going all the way back to the beginning of New London uh, and probably right through up until to, you know, the current time. Right. Yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of pieces to the puzzle. And uh, I think my notebook went on for about 20 pages or so. So <laughs> Sorry you, about uh, that. that's all right. You know, what's paper? Um, did you have any idea how is how I was going to approach the story? And did that scare you at all? <laughs> uh, I knew that we covered a lot of topics and I knew that you had a real interest in it. Uh, from our previous work together, uh, I, I trusted you and, and I knew that you would do a good job on it. So uh, did it scare me? Uh, no, but uh, uh, I think we had conversations about tying it into uh, somehow, how it re well, it was just an extraordinary coincidence that this should occur at a time when the whole nation is talking about these, these issues. Uh, it's amazing to me. But uh, so I didn't know exactly how you were going to do it, but I trusted you. And you did a great job, by the way. You did an excellent job okay. of incorporating a lot of those things in the context not only of 1848, but of 2020. That's what I was going for. <laughs> so, all right, now you get a chance to interview me for a change. I wanted to say one other thing, one okay. other thing while, while we're doing that. And that is, uh, I think this was really kismet. Uh, that's, that's, that's what this was. Uh, the way uh, the whole thing unfolded uh, was, was remarkable. The story kind of fell into my lap. Uh, you and I had a history of working well together, so I could, I could, you know, contact you and say, Lee, look, listen to this. Uh, it coincided with this whole national conversation that was going on right at that moment. Uh, the fact that the speech itself, the lectures itself were given on the property that is now the New London Day, which is where you work. Uh, you know, <laughs> Not as I mean? much anymore. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're employed. That's where right. you pay to. And, and then the fact that the story came out on the, on the 4th of July, uh, which is, or two days before the 4th of July, uh, which is the occasion for one of his most famous speeches, one of the most famous speeches in the history of America. Uh, I, I thought, this, this is magical stuff. Right. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm just grateful to have been, a, 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 had the opportunity to be a part of it. I'm grateful to you for, for writing it up and presenting it to the, to, for, to, for, to New London, and I'm grateful that the uh, the city of New London and the children of New London have a story that they can that they can. This this is a, a very historic uh, moment that they can talk about, uh, and I'm also grateful to the Stonington Pub Free Library for providing this venue and giving us an opportunity to tell the story of the story, which right. is the story itself too. Which, you, which ne never gets told, by the way. You know, I, I think that's one of the frustrations I have as a journalist is people don't know. It's like uh, m making sausage or something. You know, you, you may not want to talk about it, but, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, and as you say, it's not always pretty, but uh, it does get done. And it's interesting how it does get done. All right, Lee, you're up. Okay. All, right. All right, you're on. Uh, can you talk about what made you, what made you think a story from 150 years ago was worth your time. Okay. Well, um, as you said, it was, you know, kismet, a little amazing timing that, you know, we had been talking about the pandemic for what, two or three months, and then all of a sudden social justice and racial 
the quality uh, sort of started bumping up against that story. And we actually, we, we do uh, weekly Zoom meetings of the day <laughs> and our managing editor, I think that week or maybe the week before had said, you know, we've been really gearing up for this pandemic thing. We got to start thinking about maybe the social justice, racial equality thing needs to get a little, little more uh, precedence at this point because um, it's uh, a hot story and it's a story that if we don't start telling it now, maybe it doesn't get told for another 20 years. So, <clears throat> so I do give um, obviously the higher ups of the day uh, credit for, you know, seeing the light on that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I love a, hit, a good history story. And when I started thinking about it, and then especially when I started researching the story of Frederick Douglass, and I don't think you had mentioned the July 4th speech, but somehow I bumped into it when I was doing the research. And um, I go to like, oh my God, I'm writing it for the July 4th weekend. You know, what, what could be better than this? So, you know, uh, news stories, a lot of it has to do with timing. You know, what's a good timing to run the story? You know, what are people thinking about? What are people interested in it at any particular time? And it just seemed like, you know, Independence Day, we're all waving our flags. Well, maybe we're leaving a few people behind. So let's start thinking about them. So that's kind of how I approached the story when I started thinking about writing it. The, the, the stars were really aligned for this whole story. They really were. Yeah. Uh, what about your interviewing technique? Uh, how do you take notes and uh, how do you prepare for an interview? Well, and knowing that uh, you interview me, did that scare you? <laughs> you added that part. <laughs> uh, no, it didn't scare me. Uh, the only thing that scared me was that I knew it was going to take me a fair amount of time. And I, I do have uh, other responsibilities running a bunch of papers, which we can get into later on. But um, yeah, I knew I had to set aside a couple hours for it. So, uh, so that was my only uh, worry. Uh, interviewing technique. I mean, I've been interviewing people for 40 years now. Um, when I first started, I would have, you know, 10 to 12 uh, questions written down. And right now, I just kind of like read stuff and I have questions in my mind. And I'm always thinking who, what, when, where, why, how, you know, in my mind as I'm talking to people and sort of the questions just seem to sort of flow out of that. Uh, as far as notes, uh, I'm, I guess I'm an old timer, so I still take handwritten notes and people that see my handwritten notes look at them and say, is there any way you can possibly read those notes? <laughs> and I say, yeah, you know, sometimes it's a little tough. Uh, I look like a doctor uh, writing a prescription a lot of times, but uh, I do, uh, I do have the ability to read most of my notes. Uh, and when I'm not able to read them, I usually call people back, back. So a lot of young reporters now take notes, by the way, with their phone uh, cameras or their phone recording device, which in my estimation adds about three times the time to us to actually writing a story because you have to tran you know, you have to transcribe all your notes um, and then, you know, go back over them time and time again. And so that explains why I can write two or three stories in a time that a younger reporter will take will write one. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Okay, and and I didn't know that you that you run eight of those times uh, weekly newspaper. I didn't realize there were eight of them. Uh, but how do you fit all of this in with your other work? Uh, well. Um, I am, I'm very fortunate that I have a really great assistant editor by the name of Amanda Hutchinson. She, she lives in Ledyard and toward the end of last year we sat down and every year we kind of like go over goals for the year and I kind of told her my goal for the year is to do more writing and she said my goal for the year is to do more layout <laughs> of the pages. So I said this is a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> um, so we, we worked it out. So I used to do half the half the editions, uh, you know, lay them out. And uh, so she started doing six of the editions and I now do, do two of the layouts. So that freed me up to do a lot more writing. Um, and our, our, we have intense days on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Uh, I'm sorry, Wednesdays and Thursdays for actually laying out the pages, which leaves, you know, Monday and Tuesday to read stories, get them ready, and kind of Friday with not a whole lot to do. So I tend to do my interviews like Thursday afternoon or Friday. Uh, pretty much any time during the day, occasionally on a Monday or Tuesday. And uh, so, you know, I've just been doing this for a number of years. I used to lay out the front page of the Sunday paper at the day for many years. I did that for 12 yeah. years. So layout is really easy for me. Writing is not as easy, but <laughs> it's easier than it was when I first started for sure. So 
Um, yeah, I, th I think it just goes with desire. I want to write more. I want to keep connected with the community. Uh, I want to keep telling stories of the people that live here. And plus, during the pandemic, I, you know, people know me, so I get a lot of messages from people that have known me for 30 or 40 years from different walks of life. And uh, so I get a lot of story ideas, and a lot of them I pass along, but occasionally I'll take a few nuggets. <laughs> now, you and I did a podcast together uh, back in December, January, I think, and uh, that was the first time we'd ever met. Tell me about the experience. Did that scare you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, podcasts scare me a lot more than writing, so <laughs> uh, luckily it's not exactly live, but we sort of treat it as a live thing because we don't do a whole lot of editing. So yeah, I invited you over to our little uh, studio, uh, which is kind of cubby holed into a little niche in, uh, not far from the day newsroom, kind of kind of between the day newsroom and, and our photo lab. And uh, you know, um, I think I just saw some postings that you did about the Green Book. And I didn't realize you'd already given a speech, I think, at the Groton Public Library on that. So uh, when you came in, you know, I, you gave me some material. I had some questions to ask. And we just had a great, probably almost hour-long podcast. And uh, I, don't, I don't usually do this, but after the podcast, I started realizing, hey, this isn't just a podcast. This is actually a news story. So, uh, you know, about a, three or four weeks after I did my podcast. And in that case, I actually used the podcast as notes for most of what I wrote for that story. Right. So, um, so you know, after, you know, we had a great podcast. We just seemed to get along well. I think we're on the same wavelength in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, uh, I asked some dumb questions and you corrected me and I took it well. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of it has to do with how you get along with people. And if you, uh, if you think you can, you can sort of understand what, what they're, where they're coming from. And if you don't, you ask them a few more questions and hopefully you get on the same Wavelength. Um, yeah, so I, that was that was really cool, and the podcast was really well received. I thought and uh, broke a lot of new ground for New London, so it was fun to do. I, I thought yeah, it was fun to do, and I thought you did a great job. Really, I, I didn't know what to expect going into it, but uh, I was very comfortable during the, the during the experience. But uh, and that was great. Uh, what about the interview itself? What was your inter your uh, initial reaction, and how did that go? <laughs> Well, we started out with uh, with Douglas, and uh, two hours later, we were on to the Middle Passage project and a few other things. <laughs> but uh, you know, obviously, I love the information that I was hearing. And uh, to tell you the truth, my great great grandfather Nathaniel Howard was a sea captain in New London, <clears throat> so the Middle Passage stuff kind of always fascinated me. I started focusing more and more on that. But uh, I think I called you back back at some point and I'm going like I'm thinking about the middle passage maybe and you're going like nah Fred like Frederick Douglass that's the thing <laughs> and so I sort of went with your gut instinct on that and plus I had more notes on that and I had done more research on that and then then as I as I said the July 4th thing popped in and I'm going like I read the speech that Frederick Douglass gave and I, I go man that speech could be given today practically um it was just a barn burner. The guy's an amazing writer. Um, I would have loved to hear him speak, but uh, my understanding is he wasn't as good a speaker as he was a writer, but I don't know. You probably know more about that than I do. Well, I've never heard him speak. That is true. We're, neither one of us is that old. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. uh, you must have taken a lot of notes. Uh, well, you already kind of mentioned that. And how did yeah. you, how do you sift through and boil down that information? And what other sources of information do you consult in, in putting this story together? Well, I went, to, I went to a lot of historical sites. I can't really name all of them, um, but I really wanted to get the timeline of uh, Douglas and you know how he escaped slavery and what his early life was like. Just to, a lot of it didn't make it in the story, but I felt like I kind of needed that to get the feel for the story. Um, so I do. I probably over research things. Um, uh, certainly not to the extent you do, but uh, I did read a lot of stuff. And as I said, I ran into the July Fourth speech through that. Um, so as far as how I boil down information. I don't know, man. <laughs> I've just been doing it a long time. Uh, I, you know, it, when it comes to your notes, I usually circle good quotes and in red so I can sort of find a good quote. And when I'm writing a story, I usually try to use the quotes as sort of like the, 
the sinew that holds the, the story together. Um, so I try every three or four paragraphs to find a quote, either from you or from a historical source or from the speech. So you'll see if you read my story and sort of analyze it a little bit more, it has a lot of, uh, a lot of direct quotes in it, which I think, as you said earlier, gives a sort of cinema verite uh, aspect to, to, to the story where you're not just writing about what happened, but you're actually kind of there in the moment, which uh, when I was a kid, I always read those, you know, you were there stories from World War II and whatnot. I don't know if you did, but that was such a cool thing to, to actually sort of be propelled into the experience of, you know, D-Day and, uh, and Pearl Harbor and all that. <clears throat> and I thought I would like to get as much of that into this as I could possibly do. I, I think it did a great job. I, I, I did my homework for this uh, today, I reread that article because I realized, geez, I haven't read it in, in a few weeks. And uh, exactly what you just said, you know, the quotes, pulling it out and making it uh, relevant. And, uh, and uh, there was so much in there, so much craft in there that went into that, that uh, again, I applaud you for, for, the, for the work that you put into making that story uh, such a great story. Thank you. All right. And, uh, you made the story a little more relevant by adding a reference to the Black Lives Matter movement and a, and a vague nod to Colin Kaepernick. And you also added words from Douglas's Independence Day speech. Why'd you do that and how did you weave it into the story so seamlessly? <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but um, I think mostly I wanted to try to make it as relevant to today as possible. I mean, there was so much stuff going on and, and I think even Colin Kaepernick's uh, kneeling uh, at pro football games was starting to, you know, kind of come under a new kind of scrutiny, a little less harsh scrutiny, I think, than it was four or five years ago when it started. And I thought that was really interesting. And, um, you know, as I said, when I read the speech by Frederick Douglass, uh, I, I was like, I got to figure out a way to get this into the story somehow. Um, so... I kind of used a little imagination, uh, which you know, you're not really necessarily supposed to do in journalism, although I think it comes into a little bit of uh, usefulness when you're trying to find tension in a story. Sometimes you can't find a direct tension, but you can sort of imagine a tension. And when you're dealing with something that happened 150 or more years ago, the imagined tension is probably all you can sort of get. So, so I, did, I, did this, I did make a, you know, some sort of, I, I came up with some sort of idea that I wanted to bring it into the, into today's uh, lexicon of what we're talking about and Black Lives Matter and uh, the football kneeling seemed to be two things I could kind of quickly reference and people would sort of get it quickly. Um, as far as how I weaved it in seamlessly, I just knew that I wanted to end with the, the 4th of July speech because the story was published the 3rd of July. And I sort of started with the whole, you know, flag waving image at the beginning. And I wanted to sort of get back to the end and say, hey, here's why, you know, people are kneeling at football games. Here's why people are marching. Um, it's because, you know, a bunch of the population was left behind when the Declaration of Independence was written and when the, uh, when the Constitution was written. Uh, and that's something we're still working on. So not to say that it isn't still a great country. It obviously is, but, you know, we have a long way to go and that, that's okay. You know, it's good to have a long way to go. It means we don't sit on our laurels. <laughs> I think that's the worst thing we can do is sit on our laurels and think we can't change. You know, uh, one, one of the things that, uh, that I, I remember, I remember contacting you a few days before the article came out because I was going to be part of uh, the Hempstead Houses was going to read the Declaration of Independence. And I found out that they were also going to read uh, uh, excerpts from Frederick Douglass's right. uh, famous speech. And so I wanted to contact you and say, geez, you know, uh, you should know about this. And I was surprised that you already knew about it. You already knew uh, about Douglas's July 4th speech. I remember that. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. And, wow, he, you know, he's, he's working here. He's doing something because that's a huge speech uh, and it's gonna be talked about. And this, this whole thing coming out the, the way it did on July 3rd, uh, once again, just, just uh, amazing, really. Yeah, yeah, oh. good time. All right, now as a reporter, how much creative license do you have in writing a story and how do you gauge whether you treat a story fairly or not? <laughs> Those are big questions. Um, 
So I think one thing people should know, uh, and this may not happen everywhere, but at the day, I don't have reporters or I don't have editors breathing down my neck about how I'm writing a story. I'm given a lot of license. Uh, and I think as a senior writer, senior editor, probably more licensed than maybe someone who's been there, you know, two or three years. Um, and I don't always take the license, but I just felt like in this case, um, it was a good thing to, to take. And I did sort of, I had, I had to be somewhat imaginative because we didn't know exactly where Dark Hall was. Um, we kind of knew the neighborhood. We didn't know exactly what, you know, he said. We didn't know anything about who actually showed up for the speech. So that's what kind of allowed me to sort of, I actually, I started out imagining that La Lafayette Foster came to the speech. Um, uh, he was the guy who was the head of the General Assembly uh, at the time that, that uh, slavery was outlawed in Connecticut, and he lived in Norwich. Uh, one of my editors, who's also a big history buff by the name of John Ruddy, um, suggested that that might be a leap of faith, and I agree it was a leap of faith. Um, he lived in Norwich, which now is a 20-minute drive, but back then it might have been a you know, <laughs> four or five-hour wagon ride or horse ride or whatever. So, um, so he suggested I take that out, and I, I did. Um, uh, but I, you know, but I did leave uh, the imagination of what uh, Douglas's speech might have entailed um, using some of the July Fourth speech, um, which you know only happened four years later. Um, maybe it wasn't at the top of his mind in Connecticut at that day, but uh, it did get me to weave a, a, a nice little story together. Um, and these are stories, you know, uh, I was actually the first person ever to uh, file a freedom of information complaint uh, on behalf of the day. And I was surprised when I went to testify before the Freedom of Information Commission, they actually said that my, my stories were hearsay evidence and therefore were not permissible to be able to ad be admitted in a court of law. <laughs> and I was going like, what? This is the truth. You know? <laughs> but then 40, 40 years later, I'm going like, okay, it is a story. You know, you, you have a little license to, to, to have some, uh, you, you don't leave the facts behind, but where you can fill in some possibilities, as long as you make it clear they are possibilities, I think it's okay to take a little creative license. You know, I, I, have, I have just one last question, uh, okay. and that is, uh, do all of your stories develop this magically as, as <laughs> did? This sounds like a fun job. It, it is a fun job. Uh, I, I take every story completely seriously. Um, there's a lot of stories I could just blow off as minor stories and not really put much effort into it, but I think that's one, one of the beauties of having a byline is when you have a byline, you know, it's like if you're running a, 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 a shop uh, and your name is Smith and, you know, Smith's restaurant, you know, means much more than anywhere restaurant or, or whatever, you know, it's just, you put, take a little more pride in it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was Kismet. It was one of my better stories that I've written in the last year or so. Um, and I really enjoyed doing it. So, and I enjoyed you know, sharing it with people and, uh, you know, got a lot of great feedback. I mean, I, you know, Belinda was one of the people that wrote me, but I got probably at least a half dozen other messages directly to my email and then many more on Facebook and 99% was positive. So, uh, you know, that's, that is kind of how I gear, you know, how did I do is if, you know, if you get a negative comment, obviously it doesn't mean your story is a bad story. Um, but if you start getting 10 negative comments, maybe you kind of blew it. So, um, I do, I do listen and I do seriously consider everyone who writes me and, uh, you know, everybody's a different voice out there. And that's what I'm here for as a journalist to expose the voices of different people. So if I start blowing off people or not returning phone calls, my feeling is, uh, I've lost one of those magical pieces of light in the universe that, you know, could illuminate something for me somewhere down the road. So that's the way I like to approach stories.
And, and, I, and I think this story, uh, thanks to you getting it out in the public, uh, is, is going to have an impact. Uh, I think a lot of people are talking about it, the timing of this thing, and, and it may result in, uh, you know, not only a learning lesson for the children, but uh, uh, something like a, a plaque or a commemoration uh, of his presence here uh, that time. And, and it's owing largely to you writing that story. Well. You know, uh, writing a story is one thing, C coming up with the story and unveiling what's going on is huge. And I, you know, for all the, for all the reporters who puff up their chest and says it was my story, I go like, man, it wasn't your story. It was everybody who you quoted. It was everything. It was all your teachers that you ever had in your life. It was everyone you've ever interviewed at some point down the road about that subject. So don't puff up your chest. You're just one of the people that's trying to illuminate things. And we need more people illuminating things out there these days. So I'm, I'm just glad I'm in the position to do it. Look, I'm almost 64 years old and I'm still kicking and still writing. Uh, my father died at 63. So I'm just happy to be here, uh, able to do this. So I thank everyone who buys the day newspaper and everyone who, um, you know, reads and, and is, is part of their community and is trying to do something good for the community. So that's what we're trying to do. Well, I look forward uh, to doing this again with you, Lee, by the way, because uh, I've got a bunch more stories that I may have made reference to that, but there are a lot of stories about New London that haven't been told. And I'm just, I'm dying to do it. And uh, perhaps we can, uh, what is it that Bogart said? Uh, Louis, uh, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. There you perhaps. <laughs> that was the third version. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to open it up back to uh, Michaela and Belinda to uh, see if there's any questions from the audience out there. We'd be happy to answer. And if it's a history question, please direct it to, uh, to my friend over here, because uh, I know some of it, but, but he knows much more. 